So, as you listened to me talk about that, social science and chemistry, about Father's origins 500,000 years ago, about the fact that the human race wouldn't exist had it not been for fathers, I wonder if you didn't see something remarkable in your mind. I refer, of course, to the yawning chasm between what we know and what we do, between what science teaches and what law and public policy force down our throats. Put simply, it is not only fairness and justice. Those would be, should be enough, but it is not only fairness and justice that shout so loudly for radical changes to law and policy regarding fathers and children. Science does too. editor of the Houston Law Review. Robert writes commentary on our family law system and other related men's issues. He's a journalist for the National Parents Organization, formerly Fathers and Families, a shared parenting and family law reform advocacy group. Franklin is, is also a periodic contributor to A Voice of Men. Gentlemen and ladies, Robert Franklin. Thank you for having me. Are y'all afraid of me or what? You're so far away. Um, I do want to ask one very important question uh, of you before I begin. Probably the most important question you'll be asked today, and that is, have you thanked a badger today? If you haven't, do. Because putting these damn things on, these uh, <coughs> conferences on, is a bear. Uh, it's more work than anyone should have to do, so by all means, thank a honey badger today and tomorrow for that matter. So, today I am going to be speaking mostly about the neuroscience of parenting behavior. As regards fathers, that science is in its infancy, but already the revelations about fathers' many benefits to kids at the level of brain structure, and neurochemistry are astonishing. But before I get to that, I want to give you some pieces of good news about developments in advocacy for fathers <coughs> and equality in family courts. Most importantly, my organization, the National Parents Organization, passed last year the first and only presumption of equal parenting post-divorce. Um, that was accomplished in part because the previous year we had passed the same type of statute, equality in parenting time, in temporary orders, and it proved to be a pretty simple thing to go from the temporary orders to the permanent. So that incremental approach to lobbying from the temporary to the permanent worked well and may provide a template for future efforts. Also, another piece of good news is that Arizona's fairly weak parenting law is nevertheless being treated as a presumption of equal parenting even though it is no such thing. Studies of case outcomes after passage of the law um, revealed that judges, lawyers, and other court professionals were assuming it requires equal parenting time. The question is, why would they do such a thing? The answer is that Dr. William Fabricius of Arizona State University and colleagues had earlier conducted judicial education seminars on the social science of, share, of equal parenting. Apparently, that education worked because Arizona now t 
tends strongly toward equality in parenting time post-divorce, even though the law has nothing to do with that. Hey, you! Yes, you! Watching this video. Did you miss out on going to the International Conference on Men's Issues? Or did you go and now you miss the fun times you had at this amazing event? Experience the magic of ICMI 2019 again or for the very first time with Honey Badger Radio's ICMI Disc Set. The Disc Set brings ICMI presentations together in one convenient package, as well as Disc Set exclusive Badger bonus content. Enjoy behind-the-scenes Badger interviews with free speech and men's issues luminaries like Sargon, Janice Fiamengo, and Count Dankula, as well as a never-before-seen Badger cartoon. Also available is sparkling ICMI merch, such as our professionally designed program book, sticker sets, badges, and more. Go to feedthebadger.com and claim a piece of men's rights history for yourself. So, the point being that it may be that education about the science, the, the social science, and now the neuroscience um, of, uh, of parenting um, is, may in fact be more important to reforming laws and practices than the wording of laws themselves. Interesting, too, um, in Nebraska, the state Supreme Court has altered long-standing precedent that held that shared parenting was not favored. Appellate courts appear to be following suit. And that is probably due to a blockbuster article in the July 2018 edition of the Nebraska Lawyer, which is the house organ of the State Bar Association. In it, three highly respected lawyers pointed out some obvious things. For example, that routine practices in family courts almost certainly violate the U.S. Constitution. I'm not going to go into the minutia of family law's many constitutional problems with the First Amendment and substantive, substantive due process of law. What I am going to go into a bit, mention at any rate, is that the, our old friend, the best interest of the child standard, looks to be unquestionably void for vagueness. To pass constitutional muster, laws must be clear enough so that ordinary people are able to understand them and behave accordingly. But the best interest standard has little definition at all, as we in this movement know all too well. It's the classic case of a legal standard that's nothing but an empty vessel into which judges can dump their own ideas, opinions, and biases. And unsurprisingly, they do. As recently as last year, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned as too vague a statute that was far clearer, far clearer than the best interest standard. As I see it, the best interest standard is just one good case away from constitutional death. Few will mourn its passing. My sources in Nebraska tell me that the article frankly scared the high court judges who appear to be moving toward, guess what, the constitutionally crystal clear standard of equal parenting. Like other approaches, constitutional challenges hold considerable promise for family court reform. And there's more good news. The organization I work for has sponsored uh, numerous studies of, of the public attitudes toward uh, equal parenting in several states, such as Maryland, Ohio, Kentucky, and others. As we have seen elsewhere, equal parenting enjoys widespread, very widespread popular support in the 70 to 80 percent range. It's supported by large majorities of men and women, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Blacks, Whites, Asians, Hispanics, etc. And of course, popular support 
gets the attention of legislators. And as elsewhere, equality's only opponents are family lawyers who happily violate their, first amen their members' First Amendment rights to lobby against sh shared parenting, and feminists who long ago traded the concept of equality for continuing flows of money from men to women, in this case in the form of alimony, child support, and the division of the marital estate. The power of those two lobbies to influence legislatures is fast uh, diminishing in the face of particularly the science that militates strongly in favor of equal parenting of children following divorce. And speaking of science, for all intents and purposes, there is no reliable social science that opposes parental equality and a great deal, of course, that supports it. I'll go through that social science very quickly. To date, some 60 studies have looked into children's outcomes in shared versus sole or primary custody. In 2018, Dr. Linda Nielsen of Wake Forest University reviewed the literature, which is unambiguous. And I'm quoting Dr. Nielsen here. Is joint physical custody, JPC, linked to any better or worse outcomes for children than sole physical custody, SPC, after considering family income and parental conflict. In the 60 studies published in English in academic journals or in government reports, 34 found that JPC children had better outcomes on all measures of behavioral, emotional, physical, and academic well-being plus relationships with parents and grandparents. In 14 studies, JPC children had equal outcomes on some measures and better outcomes on others. In six studies, JPC and SPC children were equal on all measures. In six studies, JPC children were worse on one of the measures than SPC children, but equal or better on all other measures. Nielsen went on to analyze studies that considered family income and those that looked at parental conflict. Like the more general studies, those also found equal parenting to correlate with better outcomes for children. Still more recently, social scientists have concluded that the benefits of equal parenting aren't just correlational, but causal. A 2019 paper by Fabricius finds causation, and in a conference on shared parenting in Boston in 2017, some two dozen study scientists from the U.S., Canada, and various European countries agreed that maintaining both parents actively involved in children's lives is a causative factor in their better outcomes. After all, the data are clear, and when we test other possible variables, such as race, income, education, etc., and find that the last man standing, so to speak, is equal parenting to explain those better outcomes, causation looks pretty certain. Now on to the chemistry of parenting. Why do parents care for children. After all, parenting behavior is not in the interest of adult animals. Not long ago, my wife and I sat in an outdoor cafe and watched a pair of swallows feeding five hungry offspring, and they were at it nonstop, expending huge amounts of energy. The natural world is a hard enough place to survive without expending energy on young, so why do they do it? Plus, apart from the energy cost, offspring are small, slow, and weak, so they attract predators. Is this good? They eat, but they don't get food for themselves or anyone else. 
Lactating females require up to, a thir uh, up to three times the calories of other females. In short, caring for young makes the survival of adults even harder than it otherwise would be. So why do they do it? The answer is certain hormones, chemicals without which countless species, including Homo sapiens, would never have evolved. When injected with a set of hormones, including oxytocin, prolactin, cortisol, and others, lab animals begin acting parental, even though the female isn't pregnant and there are no offspring in the nest. By contrast, female rats that have never had pups want nothing to do with them. They don't like the little things. In short, at some point in the long ago evolutionary past, certain animals began producing those hormones and receptors for them in the brain. That meant the parenting of offspring became a behavior of adults despite its dangers to them. And that, in turn, made possible the socialization of young, without which social mammals, us included, would not have been possible. Obviously, Humans require extensive periods of socialization in order to be the strange and exotic creatures we are. We'd never have evolved without the parenting behavior of adults. All mammals parent their offspring, but very few of them recruit both male and female adults to do the job. Indeed, between, only between 5 and 10 percent of mammals are biparental, but human beings are one of them that are. Birds are different. Almost all bird species, like those swallows I mentioned, are biparental. For numberless millennia, our evolutionary predecessors had only females as parents. Our brain structures today tell us that. When brain, when brain scans look at mother's parenting behavior, it stems mostly from the limbic system, one of the oldest parts of our brain. By contrast, father's parenting behavior lights up the neocortex, the most recent to evolve of our brain structures. Accordingly, it's fair to say that paternal behavior developed much, much later than the maternal. That seems to have happened about 500,000 years ago. Why? Because our ever-expanding brains had undergone yet another major increase in size, rendering our young even more immature at birth. If that had remained the status quo, we would have died out because the facts of hominin reproduction, usually just one offspring, with a high probability of dying before reaching sexual maturity meant a low probability of survival for the species. Nur plus, nursing babies held up ovulation for years until weaning, and that meant too few babies for the species to survive. But at some point, it's likely that hominin females began noticing certain males who showed an interest in children, i.e., those who were equipped with the receptors for those parenting hormones. They began mating with those males, perhaps on the theory that their involvement would enhance the chances of survival of their young. The ability to use and control fire meant that animal protein became easier to digest so mothers could wean their children earlier and fathers could step in to parent them. That allowed for more offspring to be born, increasing the chances of survival of the species. As Cambridge professor of evolutionary anthropology, Dr. Anna Machen, recently wrote, quote, fathers saved the human race. Allow me to repeat. Fathers saved the human race. It's kind of a big deal when you think about it. But what, as a scientific matter, is fatherhood? 
how does it happen, and what happens when it does? What, what, what does it do for fathers, mothers, and children? Since fatherhood is a matter of our evolved biology, it can be studied by the hard sciences. And that's exactly what's happening. Around the world, scientists in as diverse places as the People's Republic of China, the U.S., Israel, Belgium, the U.K., and elsewhere, have for only the past decade or so been studying the biochemistry of fatherhood. That means the study of fathers is a new scientific frontier, one in which a scientist can break new ground, learn new things. Understandably, then, it's an attractive new field for young scientists who are stepping up to the plate. Their results are fascinating and promise to get more so. As a biparental species, human fathers and mothers biochemically form a team whose goal is the survival and socialization of the child. Each parent is equally important. Neither is needed more by the child than the other. And children bond equally to both parents. And since evolution abhors duplication of roles, fathers and mothers tend to engage in different but complementary parenting. With women, pregnancy and childbirth stimulate the production of those hormones that in turn produce parenting behavior. But where do those hormones and their associated behaviors come from in men? Well, fathers who are present with expectant mothers respond to their hormonal changes on a biochemical level. How? I don't know. If anyone does, I haven't seen it, but I suspect olfactory messaging has something to do with stimulating male uh, parenting hormones. During pregnancy, the levels of oxytocin produced by each parent tend to align with each other. That's a phenomenon called biological synchrony. The equalizing of oxytocin level tends to focus both parents on the coming infant and the need to coordinate parenting between the two. Once the child comes into the world, dad's testosterone level drops considerably. That's to ensure that he's less interested in mating with other females and more interested in caring for his child, which in turn paves the way for his attachment to his child and vice versa. Parent-child attachments are, of course, vital to the survival of children and therefore the species. Now, women's hormonal changes during pregnancy help them to form attachments to their kids. But, contrary to some uh, <coughs> prevailing opinions, men can't be pregnant. So, there are... I, yeah, just... I, just I wanted you to know that I knew about those theories. <laughs> I'm not some ignorant savage up here, right? <clears throat> but men, in fact, can't be pregnant, so their attachments come about differently. Oxytocin encourages mothers to nurse and cuddle their newborns. When they do, dopamine, often called the euphoria chemical, produces a positive feedback loop reinforcing mom's nurturing behavior. Meanwhile, newborns have an innate urge to seek out objects of attachment. That's a good thing because their lives literally depend on them. Babies without secure attachments to a parent are two and a half times as likely to die within the first year of life as are other babies. One attachment figure, of course, mom, is right there nursing them. But what about dads? <clears throat> they often report a sort of anticlimactic feeling immediately post-birth. They tend to see the newborn as an eater, sleeper, and excreter, but who offers little to no interaction. But at about the three-month mark, that begins to change. Through physical interaction with their children, 
fathers begin to bond in much the same biochemical way as mothers do during pregnancy and affectionate care. Oxytocin encourages dad's physical interactions with his child, and dopamine positively reinforces that behavior. And the child's level of oxytocin, pardon me, encourages it to seek him out as an attachment figure, and physical interaction with dad produces the same dopamine response. This is more biological synchrony, this time between father and child. So now we have our father and child attached to them via physical interaction. Apart from that, what good, if any, is produced by this father-child interaction? Well, it turns out a lot. Physical interaction and play that eventually can become rough and tumble play is vital to the father-child bond. It is ancient behavior and for it to have lasted as long as it has, must have conferred a benefit to the child's survival possibility. Play between father and child stimulates both the chemical beta, sti uh, child stimulates in both the chemical beta endorphin that at least one researcher has called the king of all reward chemicals. Plus, it's addictive. That means that fathers and their offspring are literally addicted to each other in the play that releases beta endorphin. The different types of bonds children form between mothers and fathers serve different but complementary functions. The bond with mom tells the child it, has, it is loved and has value in itself. The one with dad looks beyond the mother-child dyad outward at the world where there's a lot less love and a lot more indifference. The father-child bond allows the child to develop the confidence to step outside of mom's loving embrace and to explore unusual environments, take initiative, risks, be self-sufficient and confident with strangers, it's the source of the child's sense of individuality and autonomy. It helps kids develop executive functioning, that is, problem solving, paying attention, inhibiting unhelpful emotional responses. Plus, acquisition of language appears to be more inf influenced by father's interactions with the child than mother's. Father's involvement with children impacts the very structure of the child's brain and his. So, for example, studies reveal that as fathers interact with their newborns, areas of the brain involved in attachment, nurturing, and the ability to interpret, to read infant's cues, increase significantly in size. The father's neo meanwhile, the father's neocortex, the part of the brain involved in higher cognitive functions, did too. So there's neural communication between the parts of the brain that perceive the child's needs and the part of the brain that tell the dad what to do about them. Meanwhile, children with involved fathers have larger brain volumes with m both more gray matter neurons, and more white matter, axons. Father's brains, and therefore father's parenting behavior, are highly flexible. That's more of that, more of that complementary parenting. They're highly flexible, meaning that differing environments produce different paternal behaviors. By contrast, mother's role across cultures is, quote-unquote, tightly prescribed, to use one researcher's term. That's because mothers invest huge amounts of energy in pregnancy, childbirth, and lactating. So it's no surprise that fathers' brains make them available to do the things for the child mothers can't. They fill in. 
Again, that's complementary parenting and is found across cultures. So, for example, Harvard development, developmental scientist Robert Levine has found that environments, environments in which the risk to the child's survival is high, for example, Ache, hunter-gatherers in Paraguay, fathers tend to emphasize protection of children. In safe but economically poor areas, they'll be found teaching children skills that help ensure the child's economic survival in adulthood. And finally, where economic survival is relatively assured, fathers concern themselves with children's social, intellectual, and cultural development. Another vital aspect of father's flexibility is that if the child, for whatever reason, develops an insecure bond with its mother due to her death, serious illness, absence, postnatal depression, whatever, the father can step in and fill both roles. Indeed, in a study of gay male parents, Ruth Feldman and colleagues at Bar Ilan University in Israel, in, in Tel Aviv, um, uh, found neural pathways had developed connecting the limbic sy system i.e. the center of maternal caregiving, and the neocortex that mostly controls paternal behavior. In short, the maternal and paternal parts of the brains of those gay male fathers were communicating with each other. So what behaviors does all this chemical bonding and brain growth result in? Dad's main functions are first protection and then teaching. Homo sapiens is the only species that teaches its offspring. The young of other species learn by watching adults, but only human beings intentionally teach. Fathers tend to be outward looking, and that's the material they teach their kids. So, how to negotiate social and physical environments, build healthy relationships, form productive alliances, and acquire the basics of survival are among the matters taught by fathers to kids. Plus, a British longitudinal study of 17,000 children over 40 years demonstrates that fathers' impact on children's academic achievement is independent of mother's impact. Father's impact was critically on children's attitude toward learning. Quote, Dad was the only one who focused on molding and modeling the correct learning mindsets and behaviors. Quotes, quotes. As important, fathers teach children resiliency. Resiliency is the ability to adapt to changing or challenging situations. Father's outward focus exposes the child to age-appropriate challenges so that the child can learn to deal competently with the outside world. One Chinese study at Shangqi Normal University posits that a father's unique ability to shape his child's emotional and mental resiliency directly reflects his sex. We know from the study of the Big Five of personality traits that women tend to be overrepresented in the area of neuroticism. That high-level anxiety is not the stuff of emotional, mental resilience. But areas in which males predominate, predominate such as conscientiousness, are. Therefore, according to the Chinese researchers, resilient people tend to have what we think of as masculine personality traits. Social dominance, goal orientation, self-confidence, psychological capability, optimism, and a sense of humor overlap strongly with what we see as masculinity and are very much part of the resilient personality. Now, these researchers aren't saying, of course, that women and girls can't be resilient. Of course they can be. Children who have close relationships with their fathers 
tend to take on the masculine attributes he embodies, and that, and that in turn tends to produce resiliency in a child regardless of its sex. So that is a very thumbnail sketch of some of the more recent neurochemistry and its behavioral counterpart of fatherhood. So as you listen to me talk about that, social science and chemistry, about father's origins 500,000 years ago, about the fact that the human race wouldn't exist had it not been for fathers, I wonder if you didn't see something remarkable in your mind. I refer, of course, to the yawning chasm between what we know and what we do, between what science teaches and what law and public policy force down our throats. Put simply, it is not only fairness and justice. Those would be, should be enough, but it is not only fairness and justice that shout so loudly for radical changes to law and policy regarding fathers and children. Science does too. It demands that fathers be allowed to know their children and children their fathers from the very outset. That custody laws, child support laws, adoption laws, paternity fraud, child protective agencies, the news media, and pop culture stop sidelining fathers in the lives of their children. But despite some good news, as ever, lawmakers and policymakers generally aren't listening. We're not only ignoring the present day behavior of fathers and children, we're ignoring 500,000 years of that behavior. We're not just thwarting the well-being of children today, we're ignoring the very core of our evolved selves. Questions, comments, brick bats? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, thank you very much. That was very, very informative. Um, is, are, there, um, are there any differences between uh, same-sex parents and, um, so, yeah, are there neurological studies um, that show same-sex mothers, same-sex fathers? I, I do not know the one uh, uh, study that I mentioned about gay male uh, parents. Uh, that that's the 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 neurological uh, study that I know about. I imagine there have been, but but I do not know about them. Have a okay. There was a study that showed that the same sex um, gay men, um, the children adopted by them, outperform um, neurological matters in academic or whatever. However, the study is not very clear because they only study gay men, not lesbians. Yeah. Um, and that's because gay men are easier to study than lesbian because for two women living in the same place, you're not sure if they're actually lesbian or they're, you know, they're just roommates or something like that. So it's more unusual for two men to share a relationship. At least that's what it was back then. Um, and what it found was that it's, the data could be explained by the fact that um, the, the biggest advantage is because a father or father versus children rather than it's, um, so you have like two males and because in the study the biggest difference was pronounced between fathers and daughters so, so two fathers and a daughter that daughter can outperform her heterosexual counterpart heterosexual so it might be explained to the father yeah the uh as far as the social science on, on same-sex parenting goes, it's kind of mixed, but um, the, the, um, the effects, uh, the, the differences uh, don't seem to be real significant or extreme between uh, same-sex parenting and, and uh, uh, heterosexual uh, parenting. Um, 
Uh, but as far as the chemistry goes, I, I really have not seen anything except the one that I mentioned. Yes. Hi, my name is Roy. So, you know, I'm from uh, Virginia. So, you know, you mentioned about Nebraska, but, you know, I mean, anything specific about Virginia and, you know, how can we, you know, work together to promote uh, shared parenting in Virginia? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> the, the National Parents Organization has a very, very effective and active chapter uh, affiliate in um, uh, in Virginia, uh, some excellent people work there, um, and you can contact. Uh, that, that's the organization. That's my card. Uh, but go to the website. There's an affiliate, a uh, Virginia affiliate, and you can contact them. It's, it's, a, it's a good group. Thank you. Sure. There you go. Um, thanks a lot. That was one of the more informative and interesting talks that we've had. I'm interested in uh, what is known about the dichotomy and correlation between limbic and neocortical cortical, uh, women, mothers being uh, affecting the limbic and fathers neocortical? Like how you don't know how... Or well, I, I, your, your question is... Uh, my question is how, how pronounced is that? How, how well established is that? This is the first time I've heard of it. I think very. Really? Yeah. Tom, Tom uh, Goldman probably knows more than I. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, I was nervous looking at you. I was fearing you were going to stick up your hand and say, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Is there any data on stepfathers? Uh, again, I, the, 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 the neurochemistry, I mean, they've been doing this for 10 years. It is very much in its infancy, and there's a lot more to learn, and I have a feeling they're going to learn it because they're getting the bit, bit in their teeth, particularly at bar Ilan University in, in, uh, in Tel Aviv. They are doing great work. A certain brain... Help the, it helps the kids and the stepfathers don't. My, my guess is that there are cues that stimulate those parenting hormones in, in non-related uh, adults. Well, they must do engaged because they can't both be the father of the child, can they? I, yeah, you know. Uh, but, but I, I mean, I, I think that uh, if, I, if I want to guess, that that would be my guess is that there are cues that 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 make non fathers fathers when the chips are down. That that is my guess. But it's pregnant women. Yeah, there you go. There you go. We could do that stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good plan. Well, I recruit women to, to, to do that. <laughs> okay, got five minutes. Martin Everson, I'm a forensic science professor in the UK and former member of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto, possibly the black heart of cultural Marxism in North America. Um, it's, a, it's a divided subject, anthropology. The, um, the biological anthropologist at Cambridge who said that fathers save the human race represents one part of the paradigm. The social anthropologist, you know, the other who will undoubtedly say that this poor woman is a biological determinist suffering from her own internalized misandry. Why is it that lawyers listen to the, the latter and not the former? Why not the scientists, why the socialists and criminologists who work within the paradigm of cultural Marxism, Foucault, Derrida, and all these <coughs> charlatans? Sorry, forgive me, I got carried away there. <laughs> why, why, the, why the one and not the other? Well, uh... I, I mean, as far as the social justice people go, they've got a narrative, it's, uh, and they're sticking to it. Uh, and and, and the, the, the deal about ideology is that facts don't matter, that, that, uh, that facts, or to be more precise, the facts that do matter are the ones that agree with us and the, one, and the facts that don't matter are the ones that disagree with us and we try to forget about them. And, I mean, that's how those people roll and it was ever thus. Uh, uh, mandatory requirement for lawyers to listen to one, 
what I would argue is the empirical evidence rather than the other, which is the ideological. Well, if you're if you're a lawyer, you better you better know your opponent. I mean, that's absolutely ingrained. If you're if you are a trial lawyer, as I was, you better know your your opponent's case better than they do. And so, what that means is you have to know your case, and you have to know the other case. And so, you uh, you know, you have to know the social justice warriors. In terms of things like what well, we're talking about, like family court policy, right? Things like um, <coughs> legal policy and, and things like domestic violence, for example, which again. Um, all the remedies, supposed remedies for domestic violence, operate within this uh, cultural Marxist paradigm, as far as I can see, but ignore the evidence that comes from the more scientific psychology and sociology, uh, sorry, and psychology, clinical psychology and psychiatry. A absolutely, they've got their they've got their story and they're sticking to it. I mean, it's as simple as that. They they sideline inconvenient facts. They, they, that, that's, that's how you, that's, that's essentially the definition of an ideology. Um, and, and, and that's what that is. It was wonderful to see the combination of, of law and um, uh, scientific anthropology and psychology I, I, married together. I'm a better right. lawyer than I am a scientist, I have to tell you. <laughs> But but I have read uh, you know, I've read a lot of this and and it's absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, were you able to find any neurological differences between um, like single father parents and uh, fathers who were still uh, co-parenting with the mother, and then also uh... again this is I you know if there is that if there is that information I don't know it I haven't seen it. I have not read everything that there is to read by any means, um, but again, this this discipline is is so young, it's so new, um, that there is just so much more to learn, and I suspect that's going to be part of it. And I, I realize the the research is very new, but has it been put into like a book on its own so the topic can be you know the, concentrated? The best, um, uh, uh, this is a book for lay, uh, for lay people. It's not, uh, but but it's a pretty good combination of um, uh, of of the the hard cutting edge science and uh, written for a lay audience, a non scientific audience. It's called the Life of Dad, and it's written by that that uh, the British uh, evolutionary uh, anthropologist. Dr. Anna Machin, that's M-A-C-H-I-N, and you can get it on Amazon, of course. And it's it's a pretty easy read, and it covers a lot of the material. And it's very recent. See, she's very up to date. Uh, so if if you want, you know, something sort of condensed, uh, then then that's a good one. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.